podcast. Tonight I'm going to be talking about psychological testing and assessment and really how it fits into the big picture. Should you get it? What's involved? What's the value of it? What are they looking for? What do they give you that natural observation and, and assessment can't give you? And, and with all of that background, then you can make a, a more informed choice. I also want to talk about digesting and taking in the testing that, that might be presented to you because I think people can be challenged. These tests are often problem focused, right? They, they will identify the problems more than they will focus on, on the strengths in the individual. And at times that can be overwhelming for the individual or, or for the family. So let's talk about why testing. Why would you get testing? You already have your child, if you're out of oak, you already have your child in a program where they're being observed and you're getting reports that many parents find incredibly valuable and accurate. Um, so here's what we're thinking. First of all, adding objective and, and projection, projective measures to the natural observations completes the picture, right? It's another data point. Not any one vantage point answers or, or gives the, the total picture of an individual. But when you can, if you can, offer more perspectives, you're going to get a, a more well-rounded picture. And, and part of what happens in testing is answering the question, why would somebody show up a certain way on a certain test or measure and not show up that way diagnostically in other areas? And those questions can be discussed and, and answered through the process of, of talking to your, your testing psychologist as well as your therapist at a therapy programs. Testing generalizes well in two ways. Number one, these measures are often tested against uh, people in clinical or in society. So you have a measure of where they fit, you know, right? where does your child fit on the curve? And it gives you a, a data point in that perspective. But also, it's a kind of language that generalizes to therapeutic programs, to outpatient therapists, and to other people that will be following through, following up, with your treatment professional at the next step. Differentiating and identifying proper diagnosis in ideal conditions. While some adolescents and young adults have been tested prior to evoke, there's a lot of value in, in having substances and a lot of distractions removed from the process, right? They're settling down, they're out of a crisis. It, it, wilderness therapy, as many of you know, per, per provides a kind of quietude. So testing in an ideal condition can be helpful in adding to the equation. If the testing was done some time ago or in the context of a child using or dealing with other crises or, or issues. Um, like I said, the common language that professionals share can be valuable, right? It's something that you, that we can all read shorthand and give, get a picture of the child. Whereas narratives given by therapists can be subjective and sometimes if you have a different model or a different way of describing it, there can be something lost in translation. And this could be something that we all have as a reference point, the language that comes out of assessment and testing. And it sees things that the natural eye can see. I, I prided myself as, as a wilderness therapist on somebody who could give very detailed and what I thought to be accurate descriptions of an individual. And even with that sense of, of awareness about what I could provide, I also saw value in things that I couldn't see. There were things that testing can pick up that I can't see. How a child processes, right? How's their working memory? What's their executive functioning? Some of that shows up in natural observations and some of it doesn't. What are the aspects of IQ that might not show up in wilderness therapy because it's not a rigorous academic setting? So you're going to get information about learning issues, processing issues, that wilderness therapy and, and you know, primitive living, nomadic, small group living wouldn't necessarily magnify to the extent that testing will. And then there's some subtle differentiation and, and underlying di diagnosis that can be helpful. I want you to be assured that the testing psychologist, psychologist will have a conversation before and after testing with your wilderness therapist. So again, they're not taking that information in a vacuum. They're also taking the information that you give to them and the interview that the testing psychologist does with the child. 
young adult or adolescent child. So all of that becomes a part of the picture. It's not separate from that, but it answers and, and has reference to that. Sometimes we can rule out with testing certain diagnoses or rule in certain uh, diagnoses, right? Something that we're having a question about, this can be something that tips the scale in the direction of, towards or away from certain diagnoses. Should my child be tested? Here's my simplest answer to the question. If you have the resources, it's not inexpensive. If you have the resources, it, it, there's no reason not to do it. It's not a permanent blot on their record. It, it's, a, it's a moment in time and gives you help and answers and assistance to the treatment plan going forward, both in wilderness therapy and also in whatever comes next. So what happens? What does the testing look like? First of all, the, the, the paper and pencil test, the objective tests are sent out to the field. And then your child works on it during study time. Most often, we are capable of giving them extra study time. When there are, when there are group activities and other things going on, the, the testing becomes a priority for your child. It's very important that you complete, as soon as you're able to, that you complete the paperwork and the questionnaire that is provided you. Right? The, the psychologist can't proceed past certain points in this process without that information. And sometimes the delay in parent paperwork can lead to a significant delay of some of the process. Like I said, they consult the psychologist, the testing psychologist, and Evoke Therapy Programs does not have in our employment testing psychologists. We have those that we use. Sometimes the consultant will also have one that they use and they'll go out to the field. But they incorporate the feedback, the observation, the description. The therapist might ask certain questions of the testing psychologist, certain questions these kinds of tests can answer. There's an interview and a self-report with the student that's also included. The, the, the child is going to be removed from the primitive setting for just a moment, sitting with a staff member and the psychologist in a car. Oftentimes they get bagels. You know, we make them as comfortable as possible. It's really a reprieve. A lot of them will talk about the experience sitting in the car, having the extra bagels and treats as a real privilege, and other students and clients are eager to be tested just for those reasons. What does it cost? Somewhere, a full battery costs somewhere between $2,500 and $3,400. So that's a reference point with what it's not inexpensive, but if you have the resources, it can be a very valuable add to the program. In about one week, and after all the paperwork is completed, after one week, you'll have the results and a phone call with the psychologist to go over the results. That phone call is really, really critical. Talking to the psychologist is an integral part of it. First of all, you get to listen to what they, they found, right? They have, th there's a risk in providing testing without a conversation with a psychologist because a, a lay person's interpretation can be very dramatic one way or the other. I've read hundreds, if not thousands of these tests over my career and how I digest them. <clears throat> How my eye sees them is very different than the way that a lay person. I have a reference point. I have a curve, <coughs> a curve. I have a curve where I, I put your child in that context. They can help you understand the report better. They can alleviate and answer any concerns you might have. They can translate it into lay terms, and you can hear very clearly the recommendations. Let me give you some examples of the testing instruments and, and procedures. And I won't go all of them over all of them in depth, but I'll give you kind, kind of a flyby so you'll get a sense of what, what's, what's available. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the clinical interview. It's a semi-structured interview designed to identify and assess symptoms of psychopathology to obtain historical information from the client, from the subject. And it observes the client's behavior and interpersonal reactions. So from the very beginning, the psychologist is, is paying attention. I want to tell you something fascinating about these interviews that I found fascinating. Clients and students will reveal things to a testing psychologist 
that they won't reveal to anybody else, including their group or their parents, their home therapist, and even their evoke therapist. I imagine there's this moment in time when they're meeting with somebody that, that they trust has the capacity to integrate the information. Somebody that they might not, that they know that they're probably not ever going to see again. So there are windows and opportunities that, that clients and subjects take advantage of to share things that they haven't or won't in any, it's shocking actually, sometimes to hear from a psychologist after meeting with one of my clients and to hear some disclosure, some, some bit of information, some report that I've never heard even after working with a client and building a report for several weeks. The Rorschach inkblot test, it's a projective instrument, meaning that it's, it's hard to fake, right? You're not filling in bubbles, you're speaking, freely and, and even if you try to shape your answers to, to shape your opinion that shows up in a test like this a projective instrument used in assessing personality functioning and mental health issues this is a widely researched personality test that is often able to gain access to the internal state of the individual that other personality measures are not able to right it has the ability because of the nature of it to bypass a lot of the, the conscious and, and, uh, barriers and defenses, defenses that individuals have. The MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, Adolescent, and uh, the Milan Adolescent Clinical Inventory, or the MACI. These are personality measures based on true and false questionnaires that examine a, a wide range of social and emotional issues, including anxiety, depression, introversion and extroversion, impulsivity, anger issues, underlying substance abuse issues. These measures have been highly researched, normed across populations for many decades. And they are standardized, including validity measures, which means they can, they can tell if, a, if somebody's trying to fake good or present as extra pathological, right? extra sick. They provide common language for healthcare professionals. Intelligence testing, the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale, the Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children. These cognitive assessments produce verbal and nonverbal scales of intellectual ability, as well as a memory and information processing speed scales. This rating is frequently required by preparatory schools and therapeutic boarding schools. What I love about getting this is this is, is one of the things that reveals things that I can't see. Right, and and for some, it's frustrating because on, on we know from some of their history, they know from some of their history that they might be exceptional in certain areas, but still experiencing frustration. This can answer those questions, and that kind of frustration or anxiety on the part of a young person can lead to acting out behaviors. There's a high correlation in the research between learning differences and antisocial behaviors and substance abuse. So th that can be a very, very helpful set of, set of measures. Achievement testing. Uh, the Wexler Individual Achievement Test produces scales in areas of reading, writing, math, and oral language. This test allows for comparison with cognitive abilities to assess learning differences and academic adjustment and is also frequently required by preparatory schools and therapeutic boarding schools. Back to depression inventory. A measure of depression assessing symptoms over the last several weeks. This instrument is sensitive to symptoms of depression as they change during treatment, which means that you can test and, and retest with this. Substance abuse assessment, or SASI. This is a measure of chemical dependency and substance abuse issues, including validity measures to evaluate willingness to divulge attitudes and behaviors related to substance abuse, as well as the individual's insight into underlying environmental and psychological issues relating to substance abuse. We can see where they are in their progression of substance use, abuse, and dependence. Sentence completion, an additional projective technique designed to illustrate underlying emotional and inter interpersonal issues as the subject provides responses to a number of evocative sentence stems. Projective tests don't have multiple choice or true and false, right? You have to make it up. So when you're completing these sentences, 
you're not picking from a range of answers that are provided for you. You have to fill in the blanks. Test of nonverbal intelligence test and nonverbal intelligence. The Tony three was developed to assess the individual, the intellectual abilities of children and adults whose cognitive or motor skills might adversely affect their performance on traditional tests of intelligence. This measure is also frequently used when an individual individual's linguistic background precludes using language-based intelligence measures. Stroop color and word test is a measure of selective attention and cognitive flexibility, two aspects of executive function. So it helps to measure executive function. This measure assesses the ease with which one can shift per perceptual set to conform to changing demands and suppress a habitual response in favor of an unusual one. So that's a lot of complex language. If you want these slides, you can, you can email us. You can also look in your parent portal to find them so you can read them over slowly. So I, I won't go through the rest of them, but you get a sense about what is provided. What to expect after all of this. Remember, like I said in the beginning, these are, are problem focused in many aspects, right? They're gonna identify the limitations, the weaknesses, the diagnostics and the problems. It's not all that they do, but there's an emphasis on that. Much more so than the strengths that the individual has. Because we're looking for the problem. It's like on an x-ray. Let's say you had a, a, a knee that hurt. Well, then the doctor's gonna rule out, of course, certain issues with your knee he or she is going to focus on the problem. They're not going to spend a lot of time saying, this bone looks really good, right? They might mention it, but the emphasis is going to be on the problem, similar with the testing. It might seem extreme to the layperson, to the parent, right? It might seem shocking because they're going to lay out all the diagnostics and all the prognostics, you know, where this leads without treatment. We're looking for clinical levels. Where do they reach a comparison to other people in clinical situations versus the general population. Um, these, these measures, this report is descriptive of the problems and profiles associated with the diagnostic categories. We're talking about 20 to 30 page, pages of information that you're going to be getting from this, this testing. It's not a one or a two page document. Can they be retested? They can be retested. Many of these measures are, are, are sensitive and used for test retest model. And so if the test have, has been done a while ago, or like I said, in a situation where you think that there were other variables weighing upon your child, retesting can be helpful. Sometimes we get requests from the psychologist that things can be, things should be changed because people are worried about this being in some kind of permanent white record. And that's going to be a pretty limited ability on our willingness on the place of most psychologists. <clears throat> it is their ethical responsibility to be accurate in these tests. So to, to alter them, to, to make any, <coughs> excuse me, to make any substantial changes would be considered unethical. Will it follow them and have a negative impact on their future? Not necessarily. Right? People can't summon psychological testing in the general population. You have the right to that confidentiality as a part of your mental health file. We're going to use it. You can use it to send only to schools and professionals that need to see it. Schools that are, <coughs> excuse me, in the process of evaluating your child's acceptance or treatment professionals who need this information, who are going to benefit from, the, from this information in terms of how they approach your child. Like I said, there is an added value in almost all cases if you can do it. It becomes part of the whole. It doesn't answer every question. It's not the only perspective. And it incorporates reports from parents, reports from the, from the child, adolescent or young adult child, and from the therapist who's observing them in the field. And it's a reference point in time. It doesn't necessarily mean that these things are going to apply for the rest of their life. It can be used for, for predicting, should be planning for, for the next treatment facility and, and also at the next treatment placement, whether that be a, a home therapist or a residential, sober living, right, secondary care. Any of those settings can use that 
to help inform the, the, the treating clinician, the treating therapist. It's an objective reference point, right? It, it has in it, within it, things that are, that are measured against, like I said, other populations in, that are very research, research and very studied. And if you have the resources, right, you're going to take advantage of every resource possible. I have had a lot of parents, after getting the testing, say that it answered a lot of questions for them that they have had for many years. And I've seen it as incredible, as relieving, as, as validating. Oftentimes, to the child who takes it and gets the results and goes over it in therapy with the therapist, and the therapist will decide with the client, if they're a young adult, and with the parents, if they're an adolescent, about whether they get handed the, the results or whether the, there's a merely an overview of the results. And even in the case of a young adult, if they're handed the results, the therapist at a vote will, will sit and process it with them. I'm happy to take any topic-related questions. You, men, you mentioned testing processing, I think. Which instrument can do that, like slow processing? processing? I don't mean nonverbal. I think I answered that in the course of describing the tests. So I'd refer you back to the slides. At what point do you suggest sharing the findings, full copy, with, uh, of the testing with our children? I did share with my son's counselor at the, at the end of his senior year in high school, in a traditional boarding school, which supports that I sent to my son. My son had just turned 18. He was very upset with what he read, primarily processing issues, high risk of substance abuse issues. He is currently using the testing for accommodations at his university. I highly recommend having the testing for other, for other parents. You know, it really is for adolescents a decision that the parents and the evoke therapist and the testing psychologist make themselves. With my adolescents over the years, there were very few that I handed them the, the full raw testing report. But many of them I would go over orally with them critical aspects that would be helpful. Sometimes I handed them the report as a reality check when they were in denial about certain features. But oftentimes I was, I was digesting it for the client, adolescent client, and presenting it to them. So it's really a case-by-case -case situation. And in the case of adolescents, I rarely handed it, handed it over. I still have my testing. I remember from when I was 16, and it's fascinating and interesting. What, 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 they, what they saw. And, and the therapist will help your child not make some kind of deterministic conclusion that this means everything and predicts everything, but without treatment, without support, without accommodations, like the last parent said, these things will remain fairly predictable and static. Does the testing include an assessment for electronics addiction? And I don't think, I don't know of any that do. Not necessarily, but they will talk about features of a personality that, that predispose somebody to that kind of addiction. Sometimes the split between nonverbal and verbal can be predictive of that. Sometimes some of the social anxieties can be predictive of that. We can start to, again, take what we know, match it up with those predictive measures, and start to understand what purpose this might serve for the child. How long does it take to complete all the tests? You know, out in the field, it takes a couple of hours to, to, to fill in all the bubbles for, for the, the objective testing. And then, like I said, three to five hours in, in the car with the testing psychologist. And then the interviews with parents, the reports with parents are incorporated. The interview or discussion with the therapist is all incorporated into that. And then about one week after all of that is completed, completed you'll, you'll get a call or the, the testing psychologist will read out, reach out to you to, to share his or her preliminary results. All right. I'll go over upcoming uh, announcements, and then I'll leave it for, for any last questions. We want all current parents at Evoke Therapy programs to attend 12, 6, uh, excuse me, six 12-step support groups, Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, or, or those are all things that you can find online by going to their websites and find meetings in your area. Just try six. That's our invitation request of you. You can also go to nami.org 
to find classes and resources in your area. Social media and other resources. Most of you know that these are available via the podcast app on your iOS device. Also, if you have an Android device, you can download the SoundCloud app. And in both cases, search Evoke Therapy Programs when you get there and you can subscribe and download any of these broadcasts to listen to on the train, when you don't have Wi-Fi reception, when you're exercising, when you're going about completing chores or household activities. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for announcements, inspirational stories, and links and pictures. Uh, go to, uh, on Facebook, you can search Evoke Therapy Programs and find us there. The new Alumni Foundation actually is called the Evoke Family Foundation. So that's the new title. So I'll have that updated on, on our next slides. Go to our Evoke Therapy, Evoke Therapy blog for, for new content from Evoke's therapists. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon. You can also buy an audio version there, or you can buy it on, on Kindle there. Upcoming workshops, we want all parents who can come to these, uh, all current parents to attend. The next one is at our Cascades program in Oregon, March 24th and 25th. Ask your Evoke therapist if it's appropriate to schedule a visit in conjunction with that. If it's clinically appropriate in terms of the timing, you can, you can have a visit with your child at the same time. Contact Gail at EvokeTherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. Our, our intensives, I just got done doing two intensives back to back. I strongly, passionately encourage these. I just did one for professionals, our first one for, for professionals, and it, we, it was received with fantastic reviews. And then we did a family one at the end of last week. The next Finding You, we still have some of these available, some spots available. The next Finding You is March 14th through 18th. Um, so if you want to do deeper work, I think we have a couple of spots there. Email us at intenses at evoketherapy.com or call our toll-free number or go to the website. Parent support groups. We're going to have a therapist there on March 14th in Chicago, 6.30 to 8.30 at the Renaissance North Shore on Skokie Boulevard. So we invite all parents from the area to come out and attend for education and support. In New York City on Tuesday, March 20th, I'll be back, 7 to 9 p.m. at CUNY. That's in Midtown. And in Seattle on March 31st, Portland on April 28th, and coming soon to Connecticut, New Jersey, Toronto, and the Bay Area. Email Andrea at evoketherapy.com for more questions or information. Our pursuits trips, our adventure trips, uh, fun trips for families or young adults. Think therapy light, sober fun, reconnection. I'm happy to take any last live questions before we wrap up this evening. We have had extensive testing before Evoke, and some of the instruments were the same. Will you retest all tests or just the ones that weren't tested previously? Great question. It's absolutely based on a dialogue between you, your evoke therapist, and the testing psychologist. Sometimes yes, based on the timing, where there's substances being used. Sometimes no. Sometimes it's a very limited battery. Sometimes it's just the academics, achievement, and IQ. So it varies. It's not the, the, the full body, like I said, it, it includes several measures and is that fee and that length that I described, but it's very appropriate in some cases to have limited testing if there was recent testing that we believe to be valid. Basically, uh, <clears throat> okay, let me read this question. You think having my son would be able to listen to, I'm sorry, I'm not reading the whole question that's listed here. You think having my son would be able to listen to two songs that would definitely move him, allow him to get in touch with an appropriate message, but this message isn't in a letter this time, but the lyrics of the song, which conveys the same message, but more powerfully because it, it, it tunes into the message. Obviously, it depends upon the song. Let's just say the song is perfect or great. L let me just say this question probably is appropriate for the therapist. I, I don't want to answer about what to write with a specific child, what to share with a specific child in a letter or, or to send. So I'll just, I'll just defer to the therapist, uh, whoever your therapist is in the program. I, I feel that's outside of the scope of what I ought to be doing here. So... 
Sorry about that, but it sounded like we were getting too specific. All right, folks. Um, I don't have a specific date and subject for the next broadcast. I'll get that to you as soon as possible. I hope this was helpful for those of you who are considering testing, who have had testing, who, who, um, who don't know about testing. I hope it's a, a helpful assist to you in the process and perspective. So have a great evening. Take care, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.